from the Masonic in San Francisco. It's the Q, covering Lenovo Tech World 2016. Brought to you by Lenovo. Now here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and John Walls. And welcome back, John Walls. Here with Stu Miniman. We continue our coverage here on the Cube of the Lenovo Tech World gathering here in the Masonic Auditorium in beautiful San Francisco. And what a wonderful day it's been so far. Pretty exciting day. I hope we've been able to convey that for you. Joining us now is Brian Connors, who is the Vice President of Next Gen Infrastructure and Business Development at, at Lenovo. Brian, thanks for being with us. Glad to be here. Yeah, I've taken a look at, at, at your portfolio. So your Converge, Hyper Converge, High Performance Computing, Network Business Unit, uh, Strategic Alliance. I mean, what do you do with all your free time? Uh, not a lot of free time. That's for um, sure. Uh, look, what we're doing in Lenovo is really focused on the future. A lot of what I do and our team does around the next generation, really focused on how we can embrace technology and move it to the next generation and help customers and working with our partners to actually accelerate that and disrupt the marketplace. So next gen IT, yep. I mean, your definition of it. I mean, uh, next gen IT is really looking at kind of legacy free. There's a lot of legacy environments out there, but there's a lot of innovative technologies occurring. Take Moore's Law. I mean, Moore's Law has enabled us to go from discrete computing to virtualization of processing, to virtualization of storage and processing, to ultimately virtualization of the entire data center. So in the end, really, the data center is the computer of tomorrow. So it basically changes everything upside down. All right, so Brian, they, they, I see there's two pieces based on what you're doing. One is uh, there's the technologies that you're using you know, in your technologies, platforms, uh, yep. OEM relationship. Uh, I know the Nutanix OEM falls under yep, what you do. Good. And then there's the, the changes happen in the application side. And most of the times those two go together. But yep. can you help unpack for us as to how you see that changing world? Because we know the enterprise changes really slow. Yep. And the slowest part of change tends to be the applications. Yeah, yeah, so it's very true. I mean, but you look at what's going on in the cloud environment. You look at what's going on in the hyperscale environments where applications, born in the cloud applications, are becoming more resilient. Their, 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 their resiliency is not necessarily in the hardware and the platforms. Uh, it's in the operating environment and it's in the application development. Sure, but look, at, look at our relationship with SAP. SAP is uh, got a mission critical, ERP, in-memory database, analytics. But the HANA Enterprise Cloud is a complete migration to environments and applications that are basically born in the cloud and leveraging cloud technology and large systems to really run enterprise class applications. It's going to take time, and there's not everything that's going to happen in a public cloud. Enterprise cloud, uh, on-prem, and hybrid clouds are very, very important as a consumption and an operational expense, basically, uh, OPEX uh, model to to really uh, drive utilization. Okay, yeah, so I, I, why have you guys been so successful with HANA? Because every in infrastructure quick, quick company out there has a solution yeah. for it. Yeah, so, so we started HANA, I'd say six or seven years ago, in, in a kind of a Skunk Works project with SAP in Waldorf. We have a development team that sits there with them. Uh, they were actually just starting in-memory database. Uh, we were in there early. Uh, we were in there with our technology. At, at the time I was at IBM, we used a, a, a file system, it used to be called GPFS, now they call it something else, Spectrum Scale. Uh, but we've embedded that into the environment. So you don't have need external SAN. So you've got optimized performance, uh, you've got a solution that can scale, and we're the leader in SAP HANA appliance and configuration, basically because we're there first and we continue to innovate with SAP over these years and, and to this day. In January, we took that to another level with, within Lenovo. It really took that relationship to really around the whole go-to-market uh, area. Uh, we were just at Sapphire three weeks ago, I think it was, and uh, uh, we introduced uh, eight terabytes before Intel announced their processor support, where it was traditionally six terabyte support. We demoed 128 uh, gigabyte DIMMs with, Sam with Samsung and, uh, and uh, SAP. So we're in there innovating with them in their laboratories, physically in the building in Walton. So about the, those kinds of partnerships, so because that's not unique, right? Your re relationship with SAP. Yeah. I mean, Red Hat, Juniper, I mean, you have a, you've got a long list. How does that factor into the, your philosophical approach to doing business and, yeah. and seeking out those kinds of collaborative yeah. efforts? Well, our objective is to be the number one uh, partner in the data center, trusted partner in the data center. And to do that, we have to have trusted relationships with our partners and a very open relationship to do so. So it's mutual. 
So, you know, the SAPs of the world, the Microsofts of the world, the Junipers of the world, the Nutanix is coming up and new in the world, and the Red Hats are very trusted and very well known in the data center. Uh, our relationship with them is very symbiotic, but we're also not competing with them. We don't compete with them. We don't have a middleware business. We don't have a, an operating system business. We actually really mold, one and one has to be much greater than two when we come together with these partnerships. But Ken, our objective is to be the number one trusted partner in the data center and having trusted mutual relationships with the, with the large uh, trusted partners is very important. So it's mutual. Yeah, so Brian, you went through that acquisition of the, of mm -hmm. the, of the System X. Um, I think a lot of people understood uh, that uh, you know, moving out of under I IBM, moving to Lenovo, there was a lot of opportunity there. What have you seen? Give us kind of the update after 18 months yeah. as to those partnerships that you mentioned. Uh, you know, middleware, of course, IBM has yeah. a strong position. You know, how much yeah. of that has come to fruition as you thought, and anything that surprised you? Um, I don't know if it was surprising so yeah. much, but uh, yeah, it's only been 18 months. It feels yeah. like a little longer, but um, uh, yeah, it was a it was a challenging transition to say the least. Uh, especially in the first, say, six to nine months. Since then, it's becoming much better and customers are starting to adopt and understand who we are. So we're really the same team, same products as we were before. Uh, World-class engineering, over 20-some years of engineering and capability in the enterprise server market, so that's kind of getting behind us now. Recognition of Lenovo in the data center is something we're going through. Now, what surprised us, I think, is the openness that we have the ability to be as part of Lenovo. Uh, some of the partners before have always been a little timid. We, do, we did compete in some areas. Now, IBM's a great company. They help and they partner in, in global business and GTS and other areas with a lot of these partners, but it's a very, very much a co-opetition area. Being legacy-free, being very open as Lenovo, being a hardware platform provider and a solution provider, really started to open up a lot of eyes. You know, we, we have partnerships and capabilities at levels of the companies that we never had imaginable. But you also have to look at what's happening in the industry. You know, we're really the open one. Some of our competitors are starting to close things up and starting to get a lot more uh, competitive with some of the partners that we have. I won't go through in detail, but if you start to look at what's happening, we're starting to look pretty shiny as well. And as long as we continue to deliver great products, great solutions, and, and, and have our customer base, uh, we'll be successful. And, and how much of a competitive advantage is that for you, do you think? Or is that, is that your calling yeah. card in a yeah. way? I mean, kind of a, a differentiator in the fact that well, you're maybe moving one way and you feel like some of the market or maybe a large chunk of the market's moving another? Yeah. We got a couple of competitive, a few competitive advantages. A is our products and our people and our capability. I think that's bar not number one. Number two, we have a company who wants us to become number one. There's no, no competing technologies or products. They want us to become number one. Um, three is we are, uh, we're very strong in emerging markets. China is an example. We're, we're kind of global and local in that respect. Right? Um, and so, the, probably the final one is we ship, you know, I don't know, maybe the, the latest number, maybe 100 million things a year. So our supply chain capability is bar none, awesome. I mean, we have capability and cost benefit to help our customers. You know, HPC is a business I'm having, I have right now. It was kind of, we were on the lunatic fringe a lot uh, in my old role. With big, big systems, we are very strong in big systems again. You know, you'll see us have one of the top 500 uh, capabilities in, in the ISC show in Frankfurt next week uh, with a partnership with Intel, stronger partnership with Intel. But um, we're also winning higher education. In North America, we're, not, we're hardly losing in relations because we have, we have a cost profile that is much lower than we had in the past because we have the capability of an infrastructure that is scaled, much bigger scale than we had uh, as a hardware company before. So down the road then, um, if, if you could give us a vision inside your crystal ball here right now, um, um, well, let's just talk about the big picture. You're talking about yep. next gen IT and, and kind of where do you think you're going? Where is it yep. going? And what do you think the, the next wave might be? Yeah, so, so first, this is an evolution, without a doubt. As I said, you, you go back and you look at you know, how VMware came on the scene uh, in what, uh, 2005 maybe, or maybe a little earlier than that. And, and, and we, had, we had virtualization 10, 15, 20, 15 years earlier in, in mainframes and things, sure. right? So it's evolved, but it's wide, it's wide. With, with the, the capability we now have in our servers, it's becoming very, I'll call server-centric. Server-centric means compute-centric. 
we don't have to have specialized hardware to run storage, to run uh, even networking in the future, we have a lot more virtualization capability. So it's kind of coming home to where we are. And as long as we continue to deliver, uh, you know, Moore's Law is tapering off, but the, the amount of capability in the processor, and now we can really innovate on the software element of this in the, in the data center operating environment, we're going to start to see the movement of not only consumption, more and more consumption, private cloud, hybrid cloud, and public cloud, but also the data center itself being a lot more elastic mm -hmm. as a software-defined data center. And I just want to hitch up, you, I've heard this a few times, you know, the reference is the Moore's Law, obviously, about computing yeah. power and, and tapering off, you say. I mean, is it possible that technology kind of renders that obsolete at some point because it becomes impossible to continue to develop at that rate considering how sophisticated yeah. the technology is? The development, the development can continue, it's physics right now. It's obviously down to physics and how, how small those lines can be. Um, uh, you know, one of the large areas of innovation right now for us is going to be in machine learning and deep learning. Taking that capability and actually applying it to be uh, more analytical in nature, HPC-like, and also in energy efficiency. You, if you look at these, the density that we're getting with some of the servers, you know, it was not too long ago that Intel said that the maximum wattage of a processor will be 80 watts. We're up to 135, 160. It's, it's, it's not going to, with Moore's Law kind of slowing down, it's not going to get any any lower in power. So we have other innovations that we can go do in the data center to really drive uh, efficiency in the data center and cost of operations, which is basically very, very, very big. So right. last question I had for you, you talked about just the massive scale that Lenovo has. Um, from a technology standpoint though, is there a kind of cross-pollination? You, know, you know, you've got the, the core from the System X, yeah. you know, great history of innovation over the years, but you know, how, how does being in Lenovo change, you know, yeah. does it change the engineering and the culture at all? Yeah. Well, you remember, I came kind of full circle because yeah. I was in the PC business for most of my career. I started <laughs> in kind of the second generation of PC in, in IBM and Boca. And then it separated, and we saw a difference. We, we had a little different mindset on it. A mature enterprise mindset. But as we've come back together, looking at IoT, you know, you look at some of the announcements that were made here today and the devices with Tangle. You just look at about the amount of data and, and source of information that can come off of that. And what we can learn as we look at machine learning, deep learning capability in the infrastructure. The infrastructure, you know, you'll hear, infrastructure, we want to be invisible but it has to be operational, it has to be reliable, it has to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And to, to, with, with the amount of data being created and the amount of information coming in, we're learning it firsthand. You know, we're going to show it at uh, Supercomputer next week, the 3D. We have a big, large partner in Germany who's got one of our biggest water cool supercomputers and they've done a 3D room, basically a, th a physical uh, room. We're going to show that to, to customers' capability with one of our 3D um, uh, uh, goggles uh, there to actually give them a virtual reality of what's happening. And it's actually the, core's the, core, the core mantle of the earth actually going in and deep diving from a science standpoint. So we're applying it not just to gaming and everything else, it's being applied to, to real uh, visualization and visual analytics. Well, you're bringing it to life. There's bringing no question life. about we, that we, technology, we, bringing all, all kinds of... Cross-usage. Of... So that's a good example, probably, of what we're, we're doing. That. Brian, thanks for the time. We appreciate that. Uh, appreciate congratulations it. on a great launch today with a number of uh, fantastic products Thanks. and certainly wish you all the best down the road at Lenovo. Very good, thank you very much, right, appreciate you, being here. You bet, Brian. Thanks. The Cube continues here from San Fran right after this.